So abandonment. Let me first tell you a story uh, just to kind of illustrate how much things have changed. Uh, I wasn't born in this country, so I don't really know the inner workings of the American culture. Uh, my father was never home because he was always working, and that's how things have been for thousands of years. You know, we have been warrior cultures for also thousands of years. You know, we don't have a thing called civilization where you abide by the laws or codes given to you by the government or the state. You have a tiny little village. Uh, some people from far away come invade your land and you get into a war or a battle. Your father says to you, comes to you and says, you know, I'm going to the battlefield. Hopefully I'll see you tonight. And it's kind of a known fact. It's been part of your tradition, your custom in your village that there's a good chance that your father is not going to come back home and he's going to die on the battlefield. And you wait and you wait and you hear your mom wailing and crying because someone has broken the news to her that, you know, <coughs> her husband, i.e. your father, has been butchered. You cry, you lament, you feel sad and sorrowful, but you don't really need a therapist. You just know that's just the way life is. And human beings have been wired for a long, long time, you know, in that particular way. They don't feel as if God has abandoned them or life has abandoned them or their parents have abandoned them. So when I was born in the 1960s, my father worked 12 hour shifts. Uh, and even now when I ask him, so dad, how was it when you guys were raising us? He says, I don't even remember. What's your name again? You also lived in, a, in an environment where if you did anything wrong, not only would your parents hit you, but your neighbors would hit you. The shop owner would hit you. And, you know, you didn't have an option to go out there and pick a fight with them or harass them or sue them, take them to Judge Judy, you know, and get some money from them. Those things didn't exist. And then your mom, once in a while, because she caught you lying or stealing, she would grab you by your neck, pull you in the street, and all your friends are watching, the neighbors are watching, you're screaming, you're crying, and we lived by uh, this prison. And she would threaten us, saying that because you've lied, because you've stolen, I'm dragging your behind to the prison. So you could kind of stay there for a few days and think about what you've done. <clears throat> and then, you know, you couldn't call SPCA to file a claim against your parents, none of those things. And then at the end, then no one walked us to school. Early morning, your parents would just drag you out of bed, kick you, and you would just walk to, this, you know, to school. Uh, when we were 11, they just put us on a plane and they said, go to India. Are you guys coming? No, we're not coming, we're staying. Where are we going? Oh, you'll figure things out. So, uh, you know, we land in, I think, Bombay or Calcutta. And then there are some people waiting for us. We get on the horse or a donkey or a rickshaw and we are taken to some school. And we don't see our parents for two years. And then we go back home and they say, you guys are only staying with us for, you know, two, three, four, five weeks. And at the time, revolution was taking place. So it was fun being in the streets and joining, you know, the mass movement. And then four weeks later, your parents say, you're going to America. Are you guys coming? No, we're not coming. <sighs> we didn't have the narrative that spoke of your parents not loving you, your parents not caring for you, your parents abandoning you, your parents harassing you, assaulting you. Those stories did not exist, and they have not existed for us for a long, 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 long time. I mean, they haven't been around in human history for a long time, you see. It's not that your parents don't worry. It's just that those stories don't exist. The story, <clears throat> I mean, consider, for example, the story of Romeo and Juliet. 
It's not fashionable around the time Shakespeare was writing the play. People usually just get arranged marriage. That's how it is. You don't fall in love. You get married. I mean, read Jane Austen. <laughs> you get married because as a woman, uh, it's very difficult since, you know, the social climate is one of poverty. And to some extent, boredom forces parents to have lots of sex and have lots of children. That's what they do for entertainment, you know. And so you, all of a sudden you realize you have five girls on your hand. Well, what the hell do you do? You know, you have to wait for someone who has some money to come ask, you know, your daughter's hand in marriage. And you have to wait and wait and wait and wait. There are no parties. People can't just go out there and talk to the opposite sex. None of those things happen. <clears throat> and so the issue of abandonment, I think, and a, a lot of other perhaps, you know, issues that kids go through these days are relatively new. So one of the things you need to understand is some of the stories that you have come to believe in, some of the narratives that are psychological, are part of the social and cultural shift or movement. Let me give you an example. Imagine you go home and you turn on the TV and you watch Eminem or you watch Beyonce driving a Mercedes Benz. And if, it's hap if it happens to be Beyonce, her hair is flowing, it's, uh, you know, the top is down. And so she's driving on this highway. The ocean is to your right. The forest is to your left. And the sun is out and the birds are flying. It's such a beautiful scene. And then when the commercial ends, it says, this is the meaning of happiness. And you like Beyonce. You like her voice. You like her lifestyle. You like her body, you like the car she's driving, you like where she's driving. And so you say, well, if this is the meaning of happiness, that's what I want. I want to be happy, just like that. And so you go to in and out and you get a job and you work about 40, 50 hours a week and you save your money. And then after two years, you go to the Mercedes dealership in downtown and you buy yourself a nice car. And it's about 120,000, let's just say. And then you drive to Hayward because that's where you live. <coughs> and then in the morning you say, well, I'm going to go to Laney College because my philosophy class starts at 9 o'clock. And then the image of Beyonce and driving the Mercedes come to your mind. And then you kind of put the top down, you know, you unbraid your hair and you're going to drive. And you drive and the air is flowing through your hair and it's really, really nice. And then the moment you hit the highway, there is traffic. You look to your right, concrete. You look to your left, concrete. And on the side, you see all these tents because homeless people are occupying them because society is far too corrupt, far too contaminated to take care of them. Politicians are far too selfish. And uh, you say, this is not the forest I was hoping to see. And this is not the ocean I was hoping to look at and experience. And I certainly didn't want to see tents because then when I see homeless people begin to feel guilty about the $120,000 I spent on myself or some ridiculous car. And then you think that the roads are going to be open, that you're going to drive about 120 miles an hour, but there is traffic bumper to bumper. And all of a sudden your desire to be happy has turned into one of frustration. You know, it is true that this piece of advertisement sold you the concept of happiness, but it has no actuality. It has no reality. You don't live in the middle of the forest. You don't live by the ocean. And you realize that you've been duped. Society sold you a concept of happiness that you can't actually practice or exercise or even live through. It doesn't exist for you. It can never exist for you. Now, you may say, well, okay, I want to grab my stuff and move to the forest. You're a city woman. You've been in, living in the city for the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You know, it's like you have this deep, intense relationship with city and city life and city concepts. How the hell are you going to divorce the city and all the things it has given you for the past 20, 30 years and go to the, to the forest? You're not even there yet. You're not that mature to kind of say, I'm fed up with everything society has given me. Okay, so the thing I'm trying to suggest to you is some of the narratives that we have today about what it means to be a parent. My parents said A, B, C, D to me. 
you know, I'm not saying that it, it's right for them to do what they have been doing for thousands of years, but all I'm saying is that the narratives that we have today have intensified the sort of interpretation we have of those experiences. <clears throat> now, having said all of those, let's jump into this thing called abandonment. Now, one of the things I think I should maybe perhaps make clear at the very beginning is, you know, my mind uh, works like a detective. And I say that because I am really good at what I do. I love what I do. I've been in love with this stuff since I was 10. Add to it the fact that I come from a culture where you're forced into thinking about political, social, religious issues. Okay. Now, to do right by your passion, you have to be a good detective. And by detective, I mean you see a crime, but you can't just be consumed by the fact that there is a dead person laying on the ground. Because if you do that, then you're going to be overstricken with grief and then sadness and sorrow, and then you'll suffer from paralysis. Okay? You see an episode. It's a man laying or a woman laying on the ground, and they're not moving because they've been shot. Or maybe they just had a stroke. So what do you do? Very quickly, of course, the, the event touches you deeply, but then you walk away from the scene. And by scene, I mean you have a physical experience. It creates emotions inside you. Okay? And then you have a couple of options. You can either get consumed by the emotions and then become contaminated, where you lose your ability to think soberly, to reflect clearly. Okay? That's what happens when you get drunk, whether by alcohol, drugs, or emotions. It doesn't really matter. That's why when you become angry and you scream at your mom or your dad, your companion, 10 minutes later, you go back and you say, I'm sorry. Why? Anger consumed you. You were drunk by anger. Okay? You go for a walk. You become sober. You throw up. You vomit. Whatever it is that people do when they get drunk. All right? And then once you're sober, you go back to your community and say, I was wrong. I apologize. Maybe I was right, but I expressed uh, how I was feeling and thinking in the wrong way. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about abandonment, the first question that for me becomes important is it's very different when you're abandoned at the age of two than the age of 22. See, my father is 90, I am 60. If my father dies, in essence, he's abandoned me. But I'm a 60-year-old man. I have been on my own two feet for the past 50 years. So he has abandoned me, yes. But this abandonment, sure, it becomes tiny. I'm angry because my father is no longer here. Then I get really sad. Then I become sorrowful. Then I become depressed. Then my depression goes through this thing called the grieving ritual, where about 30 of us will gather, have food for the next 40 days. We're all well black. We don't shave. Okay. And then after a while, my father's memory will continue to live inside me and our community. There is no sense of abandonment. He's a 90-year-old man. It's time for him to die. Okay? There is no reason for him to live any longer. I don't want him to get cancer, be stuck in a hospital bed with lots of tubes coming in and out of him. That's just a very, very bad death. Okay? Now... So, now you may be 22, and it may be your first love. That's a different kind of relationship. You have never experienced love before, okay? Your sexual orientation matters very little. Gender matters very little because love does not discriminate. You fall in love when you fall in love. That's just the way it is. And the process of falling in love is always the same, and its impact is always the same. You become an artist. You become a poet, okay? Now... Let's say you're 22 and you fall in love and this happens to be your first love relationship experience. And you give, and let's just, his, his or her name is Jay, okay? And you give 110% of everything that lives inside you to this person. That means that he becomes your journal. All the things you have kept within, all the things that have always been private to you, now you write in Jay's mind and Jay's heart. 
That's a lot of trust. That's a lot of faith. Add to it the fact that whenever you fall in love, fantasies are created. Marriage, children, a house, a long-term relationship that both of you are going to kind of walk into the sunset together, okay? That you will take care of him. He will take care of you. And there is a good amount of certainty that this is the person that I found and I'm going to hang on to him for the rest of my life. Okay. Now, whenever you fall in love, and remember love is like another set of emotions that consume you and you get drunk. And whenever you get drunk, remember with anything, whether it's love or anger or resentment or jealousy, you can't think clearly. And if you want to survive life, you need to think clearly. Okay. Now, if it happens, now let's just say, I know you were in here uh, yesterday or the day before. Uh, and you get broken by love in the sense that eventually he or she will come to you and say, I'm really, really sorry. This is not working God for me. I think whenever you get into love relationships, the people who lose the most are women. Because women really reach the age of maturity. I don't know how it happens. I don't know why it happens. Maybe God made it this way. Maybe it's just biological evolution. I don't really know. Okay. But at the age of 10, they, they, you know, because they see their mom, because they're very close to their mothers, because psychologically, biologically, they're just very strange species. Okay. They can govern themselves really, really well. Men, on the other hand, you have to wait for a long time for a man to become mature. So if you're 22 and your man is 25, for example, men are usually behind by 10 to 15 years, which means that in essence, you're going out with a 10-year-old. He may look like a 25-year-old guy, but emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, he's 10. So what's going to happen is he's like a leech. A leech is something that gets stuck to your meat, to your body, sucks all the blood. And then when its, its capacity is full, it just unattaches or detaches itself from your body and just moves on. Sometimes it even explodes on your body. So what happens for a woman, for example, runs into a man. The man loves her. She loves him as well. But the man sucks the life out of this woman, becomes saturated. Talking is no longer as interesting. Sex is no longer as interesting. Going to the movies is no longer as interesting. And there comes a breaking point where the man looks at the woman and says, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I'm sorry. It's good to know you. Bye. And then you're left abandoned. Now, this is 22. You have a sense of abandonment. Then you have another kind of abandonment that's far more intimate. Okay. That's at the age of two. You can hardly walk, okay, or run, okay. So this is about love relationship. This is about parental relationship. Now, all these different sources of abandonment, they create different psychological issues. Now, my question then is the following. Are you talking about a father who was 90 and passed away? Are you talking about this? Or are you talking about this? There is also another thing that you need to understand, which is, you know, life is a very, very strange phenomenon in the sense that, what is that poem? Something, Ishq u ra gardun nadara tahammul chun mi tawana kishidan in peyker la gharaman. That, you know, a cow or a dog a dog is not burdened to figure out who she is, what she ought to do, what is right, wrong, what her, his identity is, meaning, fulfillment, happiness. A dog is not burdened to carry all of that. Human beings, for a very, very strange reason, in a single lifetime, you got to figure out these days, if you're a man or a woman, okay, what other, you know, what branch of uh, 
sexual orientation you are, gender orientation you are, what the meaning of your life is going to be, if you want to be a historian, if you want to be a philosopher, if you want to go into accounting, you know, if you want to live in America, if you want to marry John or Jack or John, we don't really know. And at different stages, you're confronted with different set of questions. You know, when you're two, you want Spider-Man toys. When you're five, you want a bicycle. When you're 25, you want a car. When you're 55, you want healthcare. And you realize that desires and questions and issues have no end to them. And they keep attacking you and you have to figure out what they'll to do with this mess, okay? So from a different perspective, consider all human beings to be abandoned because eventually my answers are not gonna work for you. You and I come from different generations. Okay? Our foundation is different. We are conditioned differently. I am about to die. You're about to start your life. I have 50 years experience over you. Okay? So whatever my answer is going to be, however we do this, it's not going to work for you. It's fun. It's entertaining. The only way it's going to work for you is the following. You see, you have a different set of taste buds inside you. I will give you the ingredients, but you have to go home and cook them in a way that fits you. You can't plagiarize the stuff and you can mimic the stuff because that stuff only works for me, not for you. All I can do is give you the tools and then you got to figure things out on your own. But you have to be passionate, you have to be interested and you have to care. Otherwise, the tools will be like the ones I have in the garage. They're just sitting there. Okay. So from the outset, know that all human beings have been abandoned. You know, it may be that today you will go home and read the book of Job and the book of Job will talk about some of the problems that you may be having, some of the concerns you may be having, some of the pains and sorrows and feelings of betrayal that you may be having. But the book of Job will speak to your heart today if you Get up in the morning and read the book of Job again tomorrow. It may not speak to you. And all of a sudden you say, the book of Job has abandoned me. It gave me answers yesterday, but not today. And that's just the way life works. So from the outset, know that you and I have been abandoned. And you and I are burdened to figure out what they'll to do with our lives. We're going to slip up. We're going to mess up. No one knows what it means to be a parent un until they become one. No one knows what love is until they fall in love. No one knows what betrayal is until they become betrayed or get betrayed. Okay? So remember, we are hands-on creatures. See, right now you may come to class. I had a student, my, one of my uh, classes started this, this week. And I had this like very strange email. These are your interpretations of like this particular class or this Greek philosophy. You know, uh, I have a feeling that this is like spiritual, religious class, not so much a Greek philosophy class. So what you do is you enter something with expectation and you realize your expectations are not met. Then you feel betrayed and abandoned. Now, the email may have been good. But what the email reveals to me that this is a guy who speaks well, but doesn't know how to think well about anything. Okay, now, this, this, or this, which one are we talking about? I'm sorry? This? Okay. So let's get rid of all of this. Did you see the uh, last Rambo movie? It really, really sucked. It was a bad movie, but nevertheless, what happens is, you know, John Rambo is living with this older woman and this young woman, I think they're like related somehow. And this young woman says, I want to go to Mexico and have a good time with my friends, you know. And uh, the mother says, don't go. Rambo says, don't go, but she goes. And one of the things that she does is she knocks on this door and this door opens and this man opens the door and it happened to be her father. And she asks him only one question. Why did you leave me? 
And this is a girl who's like 18, 19, 20. She's very attractive. Her life seems to be relatively okay. She has lots of friends. She has money. She has a loving grandmother or a mother. And she has John Rambo, of course, who's like a superhero that protects her and does whatever she needs uh, for her. And yet none of those things are enough. She goes to this place not to drink, not to smoke, not to have sex, but to figure out, understand why did her father leave her at such a young age? And uh, he looks at her and says, I never wanted you. I told that woman to, I, I, I don't, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the movie too well at this stage, but some like, I never really wanted to have children, or at least I didn't want to have you. And uh, she's about to cry, and then he slams the door shut, and that's it. You know, parenthood begins with a fantasy. They've talked about this plenty of times, but let me just go back in time. And I'm going to say, use myself and say, like Jacqueline sitting over there as an example. You need to understand all of this. I'm 18. Jacqueline is 18. We are at a party. She looks really, really good. I see her. My visual sends a signal to my brain. Oh, she's really, really attractive. Am I ready for a relationship? I don't think so. Do I have money? No. Am I educated? No. Do I have a job? No. Do I come from a relatively good background? No. What I do know is I find her to be profoundly attractive. Now, what is the function of pleasure? I look at this cup of coffee, it brings me pleasure. I want to satisfy my desire for coffee, so I drink it. <clears throat> I walk. I ask her, what's your name? Jacqueline, how old are you? 18, what do you do? Nothing. Do you want to do something? Yes, let's go to my truck. That's how it begins. And I'm putting this in a very, very crude way, just to save time, okay? Now, <clears throat> what is it that I want to do with her when we're in the truck? Am I going to read the Bible to her? Am I going to talk about social injustice? Huh? Am I going to see if she has any connections to people at Home Depot so I can get a job there? No. I'm there for one reason. I want to have sex with her. Why? Very much like coffee. I see her. My visual says, when you look at her, sensations, positive sensations run through your veins. Go. Talk to her. I desire her. Then I want her. Then when I'm, when I'm sitting close together, I need her. I don't need her mind. I don't need to know her history. I need her body. Do I know where it's going to go? Absolutely not. Am I winging it? Definitely. Is there a future? I don't really know. Now, why do I say I don't know? Because I don't know how I am going to behave once I am physically satisfied. In other words, once I have an orgasm, I don't know if I'm going to say I'm going to leave. I mean, these are things you need to understand about human relationships. You see this? This is my third cup of the day. You know what I do when this class is over? I dump it in the trash over there. The coffee, the liquid doesn't know this. Even I don't know this when I make it in the morning. But that is generally what it happens. When I'm saturated, in other words, when my desires have been fulfilled, I look at this coffee and say, man, this is heavy. I want to just dump it, wash it, and put it in my cabinet. <sighs> Maybe I like her. Maybe we'll stick out, just hang out together. Okay? And then what happens when her and I hang out more? Well, I begin to like her. I'm not yet fully satisfied. You're not going to have sex as much. 
But now we go out, we have coffee, we have food, we have this, we have that, and it's enjoyable. I see her parents, she sees my parents. But remember, she is not my fourth cup of coffee just yet. She may be my second. She may be my first. I am not yet completely satisfied. Yeah, Naon? First of all, you know, being in any kind of a relationship, for the most part, depends on what it is that you want. That depends on where it is you want to go. That depends on how do you see yourself. Am I making sense? Look. I don't want to just have casual sex, because I know the outcome. I'm going to feel pretty crappy afterwards. And I don't want to just have a fling. I'm going to have a crappy set of emotions for the next two, three, four, five weeks, and I can't function. At my age, I know what sort of experiences I want, whether it's with a man or a woman or a dog or a cat. Okay. There is a stray cat who comes our way once in a while, and I just went and got some food. Every time I go to home, she's sitting right there. Now, I know I have the power to go to the garage, get some food, and put in, uh, and the food on the plate and have the cat eat. But I also know that I'm tired, I want to go inside. But because I know I have the power to satisfy the desires of the cat, I force myself to go into the garage, pour some food, and then go and rest. I don't want to deal with feel the feeling of guilt that I know I can do something, yet I allow sloth or laziness to overtake me. Because I know the emotion of guilt well. I know what power is. I know what happens when you don't use your power in the right way. I also know what happens when you're far too lazy. Okay? So I try as much as I can. And I slip all the time, don't get me wrong. Okay? So setting your goal really depends on who you think you are. And who you think you are depends on what sort of advertisements you've had in your life. 